Whenever I have to explain to people what I do for a living, it's always a little bit challenging because most people don't interact with industrial lubricants on a day-to-day -day basis. If they do know anything about oils, it's likely the oil that they put in their car or else it's some kind of comment about WD-40. Now, here's the thing. Personally, even though it might be advertised as a lubricant, I really don't think WD-40 is a lubricant. It's many things, probably not a very good lubricant. So let's use some of the concepts we've explored in previous videos to better understand what WD-40 is and maybe what it's not. So if it's not a lubricant, what is WD-40? Now WD-40 is actually a range of different products. Most people know kind of like the classic version. And of course, everyone pretty much is aware of the mythology. WD stands for water displacement, and it was the 40th attempt. Now, whether that is simply the law or whether that's actually true, yeah, it kind of doesn't really make a difference at this point. WD-40 has become synonymous with this particular product, which you might call the classic WD-40. Now, what exactly is it? I've heard it described as a number of different things, a solvent, a surfactant, a corrosion inhibitor, and of course, a lubricant. Now, surfactants and corrosion inhibitors are basically just additives that we would put into the system. What exactly do we mean when we say that something is a solvent? Now, I think it's helpful at this point to kind of look at some of the documentation to try and figure out exactly what WD-40 is. So if you looked on some of the safety data sheets, for example, here's one for Australia where it details some naphtha, that is to say, you know, petroleum or hydro-treated petroleum, as well as some petroleum base oils. Uh, then you've got the same thing from the UK. Again, it has an associated CAS number, which identifies hydrocarbons anywhere between C9 and C11. So that's the number of carbons that are in the chain. Then you've got the one from US. Again, they've all got different CAS numbers, aliphatic hydrocarbons, petroleum base oils, that sort of thing. And then of course, you've got one from quote unquote Asia. Asia is a pretty broad area, but again, distillates, petroleum distillates and non-hazardous ingredients. Now, what's interesting is that if you summarize these all in a table, given the low and the high ranges that you see on the SDSs, you can start to build up of a picture for what the majority of WD-40 is. Now, the bulk of the product is made of petroleum base oils, as well as hydro-treated petroleum naphtha. That gives you a bit of a flavor for what the product mostly is. And if you'll remember, when we have our crude oil, one of the first steps that it goes through is an atmospheric tower where we take crude oil, which is, I've likened it to a box of Lego, where we have all kinds of different shapes and sizes. And the atmospheric tower is able to then distill different uh, molecular fractions. So the stuff that is very light comes out the top, the stuff that's very heavy comes out the bottom. So you can think of this as being a bit of a continuum where light molecules like gases go out the top we work our way through, you know, petroleum, kerosene, diesel, heavy gas oil, and eventually you'll get sort of the bitumen style products. Now, if we were to look at as the C number increases, so C number is the number of carbons that are in the chain. Now remember, methane is the first one, CH4, so there's a single carbon, that's a gas. And as we go up the number, we slowly get heavier and heavier and heavier. Now, one thing that you'll notice lubricating oils is at the bottom in purple and yellow where we said naphtha and petroleum distillates right that is what makes up the majority of wd-40 that sits at the lower end so again anywhere between roughly c6 and sort of c12 c13 that's probably what you'd consider naphtha it has a quite a significant overlap with something called a stoddard solvent so that's kind of where we get this idea of it being a solvent now what is a solvent you know, does something dissolve something else? So S-O-L-V is kind of the root of that word. Does it dissolve something? Whether a liquid is actually able to dissolve another solid has really got to do with the types of molecules and the similarity of the molecules between the solid and the liquid. So, you know, the term solvent kind of gets uh, thrown around a little bit. There are many, many different kinds of solvents. It's got less to do with the size of the molecule than it has to do with the type of molecule. Now, what's interesting is that Wired Magazine actually did a bit of a breakdown of uh, WD-40 and exactly what's contained within it. And what they found was that the primary components are things like nonane and decane. So that's C9 or C10 type alkanes. And an alkane is a straight hydrocarbon. So that gives us a bit of a flavor for what exactly is in here. Now, going back to our table where we had everything out of the SDS, one thing that you can do is you can take a look at all of them and build a picture. And you say, based on the minimums and the maximums that have been identified in all of these you know, different SDSs, what we can say is 
anywhere between about 60 and 70% of the total of WD-40 is these petroleum base oils that are in that sort of C9 to C11 range. Now let's take a look at the actual data sheet itself. So this is a technical data sheet, which is issued by WD-40. And again, they can tell you a little bit about what they intend the product for. One thing that I think is of note, right? It does say that the product lubricates moving parts. So WD-40 is indicating that it is some kind of lubricant, but if you scroll down a little bit further, you'll see a kinematic viscosity measured at 38 degrees Celsius. Now that's not really the industry standard. I think they've chosen it because 100 degrees Fahrenheit is a round number. In the industry, we typically would measure kinematic viscosity at 40 degrees Celsius, but you know, 38 to 40, we're splitting hairs at this point. And one thing that you'll see is the viscosity at 40 degrees Celsius is 2.8 Centerstokes. Now, if we can go back to our chart of different lubricant viscosities, where, you know, let's say 2000 is approximating something like honey, and 40 centerstokes at 40 degrees Celsius is approximating something like a vegetable oil. One thing that you'll notice is that the ISO viscosity grades, which are measured at 40 degrees Celsius, indicate that most of the industrial lubricants that we use are significantly more than 2.8 centerstokes. Right, so the lightest of the hydraulic oils will typically start at like an ISO 15. The gear oils will be, you know, very typically ISO 223, 24, 60. These are significantly thicker. And so when we talk about whether something is a lubricant or not, what we are typically referring to is that sort of base oil viscosity and its capacity to carry load. Now, for reference, as an example, diesel runs at about six centerstokes at 40 degrees Celsius and gasoline is close to two. And you would never say that gasoline is a lubricant. You know, diesel sometimes has a little bit of lubricity to it. We sometimes put additives into our diesel to improve the lubricity. But I doubt that you would argue that something like a, a gasoline or a petrol has sufficient viscosity to be a good lubricant. So let's think of the uses of WD-40. So let's say, for example, I have a, a bike chain. Right, so how do I construct my chain? Right, obviously I'm linking these things together and there's a pin that sits inside the links. Now, one thing is that if I spray WD-40 at my bike chain, what is really the intent? Is it to lubricate the bike chain or is it to more kind of clean debris away from that chain? And I would argue that the primary purpose is the cleaning. Because if you look at, for example, the clearances that you see on a bike chain, these clearances are pretty small, right? And so what you need is a low viscosity product to be able to penetrate into those small spaces. So just as a thought exercise, imagine trying to pour honey onto your bike chain. Honey is thick enough that it wouldn't be able to get into these small spaces. So it wouldn't be able to get in between the pin and the links. And therefore, you wouldn't be able to flush away the debris that you might have picked up on the road. So what you need is something that's very, very low viscosity that's able to penetrate into those gaps. And that's why WD-40 is so effective at doing things like door hinges or chains because it's able to really get into those small crevices and flush away a whole bunch of debris. So on a door hinge, for example, maybe it's stuck because there is a certain amount of corroded products that are in there. There's a certain amount of rust and something like a WD-40 is going to be able to get in there and flush all of that stuff away. All right, so that's the viscosity properties of WD-40, or the lack of viscosity is probably more important. Another thing which is interesting is the flash point. The flash point is very, very low. And that makes sense because when you have low C number molecules, right, these are light, they tend to be more volatile because they are more gas-like, you know, for want of a better word. So as we go to something like a C1, which would be methane, methane is obviously a gas, it's very volatile. Then as you go to sort of propane and butane, they tend to form gases very easily. If you are, you know, pretty adjacent to that, you're a C8, C9, C10, there's gonna be a lot of vapors which are formed. And again, that's another reason why WD-40 doesn't really make a very good lubricant because after you've sprayed it, so much of the liquid volatilizes off that it doesn't remain in place as a lubricant for very long. So the flash point can tell us a lot about the fact that WD-40 isn't necessarily gonna stick around in the long term. All right, some other information that we can glean from the data sheet, right? On the second page, we've got some numbers for, let's say for example, 
lubricates and protects 0.7 millimeters, extreme pressure lubrication at 1200 pounds, corrosion protection at zero to 20% in 72 hours. What exactly do all those mean? I find it interesting that such a consumer driven company like WD-40 would put these numbers on a data sheet because to the average consumer, this doesn't really mean anything. But to us who are in the know, obviously the first is the four ball wear scar test, the second is the phallex, and the third is the salt spray or fog test. Now I think it's interesting to look at the four ball wear scar because we do have data from some other lubricants to be able to compare it to. So 0.7 millimeters at 77 degrees Fahrenheit, how does that compare to a range of other industrial lubricants? Now remember that in this instance, the lower the number, the better, because you want less of a wear scar. Now for this exercise, let's go over to my industrial lubricant database. We can scroll across, we've got a fair bit of data here. Okay, this is now most of the wear tests. Okay, four ball, that's the four ball EP. And now we've got four ball wear scar. And if you just start to scroll down, there's not that many which kind of list the numbers, but okay, a Castrol High Spin AWS listed at 0.4 millimeters. Um, let's have a look, Optigear Synthetic 0.27. So obviously these numbers are all lower and we would expect that, we would expect lower than WD-40 because these have more viscosity and therefore more load carrying capability. They might even have EP additives in them, for example, that are helping to assist with that four ball wear scar performance. Now, as we scroll down the list, again, there's a Sinopec uh, heavy duty industrial gear oil at about 0.35. Just as a, a note, if your company wants uh, some kind of API access to this database, just uh, get in contact with me. Now, just let it be known, WD-40 is perfectly aware of this, right? So let's go back to our bike chain example. Let's say, for example, we wanted to lubricate our bike chain. We know that something that's very, very low viscosity and also very volatile is number one, not gonna do a very good job of load carrying, but number two, it's not gonna stay in place over the long term. And that's kind of difficult. So if we zoom in on what sort of a, a typical plane bearing would look like, in an ideal world, we would have some kind of liquid lubricant that's helped supporting the load. But if we don't have that, what are our options, right? What we want is for that spray to leave behind some kind of lubricating residue, whether that be some kind of EP additive or potentially some kind of solid. Something a little bit more similar to a graphite or a molybdenum disulfide, maybe a PTFE or a Teflon, that can remain in place and can act as a solid lubricant for the chain. And of course, WD-40 recognizes this, and that is why they have such a wide range of products. So one of them, for example, that you can see on the right, it's a specialist dry lube PTFE spray, right? So you spray it on, it's able to get into all of these crevices, it leaves behind some Teflon, and that is the thing that actually lubricates over the long term. All right, so through that exercise, what have we discovered? If anything, WD-40 is actually the opposite of a lubricant. The whole point of WD-40 is it is so low in its viscosity that it's able to penetrate into areas where typical industrial lubricants would not be able to access. Unfortunately, the fact that it has such low viscosity makes it a relatively bad lubricant over the long term. So what exactly is it? Well, it's a very good cleaner and it is able to give you some measure of corrosion protection as well. I would describe it more as a cleaner that's able to free things which are stuck. So like I said before, if you have a little bit of rust or corrosion, it's often able to clear away that debris and get something moving. But if you want long-term protection, you need a dedicated lubricant.